Hey guys, all right, by now you should have already taken your test. And excuse me while I multitask, I am putting together the paper test for class today. Um, and you should be on the assignment of the introduction to the animal kingdom. So everything we're going to discuss from now till the end of the year is going to be considered an animal. So there's going to be no more bacteria, no more domain archaea, domain bacteria. Everything is going to be in domain eukarya, kingdom animalia. So we're going to move on to talking about phylums. But before we can talk about phylums, we need to know about the different types or the different ways to identify animals. So we're going to go through that really quick. So it asks which of these is an animal, and the answer is all of the above. So in order to be an animal, you have to be heterotrophic, meaning you consume something else to get your energy. You have to be eukaryotic, meaning your cell has a nucleus. You have to be multicellular. That's why the protists aren't animals. They're only one cell big. And you have to lack cell walls. 95% um, of animals are vertebrates. Only 5% are invertebrates. And those 5% are where we're going to spend the majority of our time in marine and aquatic science because the majority of the animals that are invertebrates live in the water. So biology is the study of life. Um, physiology is the study of the function of organisms. Anatomy is the structure of organisms. So if you take anatomy and physiology, you learn the structure of organisms and then you learn how they all work together. Um, zoology is the study of animals and the anatomy and physiology of animals. Marine biology is this basically the anatomy and physiology and zoology of marine animals. So that's where we are. So animal functions. An animal has to feed. It has to get its food somewhere. Hopefully this isn't the first time you've heard these things. So a carnivore eats meat. An herbivore eats plants, an omnivore eats plants and animals, a detrivore eats decaying organic material, and filter feeders strain their food from the water. Uh, those are going to be like your killer, or not your killer whales, your baleen whales, your humpback whales, those kinds of animals. We're going to learn more about other animals that do that. So here's your filter feeders. This is a sponge on the left, and on the right you have a whale. A parasite is an organism that lives in or on another organism. You've got roundworms, tapeworms, ticks, bot flies. On the left is a picture of a tick. On the right are pictures of roundworms that have infected the intestine of an animal. Kind of gross. Grosses Miss Neal out. I don't like to talk about them very much, but they are parasitic. Uh, respiration. An animal, in order to be considered an animal, you have to respire some way which means you have to take in oxygen and give off carbon dioxide. So you can either use lungs, which are right here on the right. You can use gills. So this is a picture of a fish. Its head's cut off like, like this, like head, body, slap down the middle. These are his gills that you can see. The red is the blood. Remember, blood is what carries oxygen. So gills are bright red in color. And then some animals also use diffusion. You have to be able to circulate. So if you're very small, you can rely on diffusion. If you're big, you have circulatory systems. To the right is the circulatory system in a human. So what's been done is it's been plasticized, and then all of the other uh, body systems have been removed. So this is an actual human that was once alive, and this is what our circulatory system looks like inside our bodies. You have to have a way to excrete. So uh, the primary waste product of humans and most animals is ammonia. Our organ of excretion is a kidney. Other animals have different organs that they will use for excretion we're going to talk about. You have to be able to respond to stimuli. So um, when you hear a stimulus, you have to have a response to that stimulus. Think uh, Pavlov's dog. Whenever the bell rang, the dog salivated. So you have to um, fight or flight stimulus, swim away from the light, swim towards the light. All of those things are reactions to different kinds of stimuli. And you have to be able to move. So some animals don't move at all, like sponges. They're considered sessile. Some can swim, some can crawl, some can fly, some can run, some can slither. So the difference between a quadrupedal and a bipedal is a quadrupedal has four legs. Bipedal has two. Terrestrial is on land. Aquatic is on water. 
Cecil means that you can't move. You're stuck in one place your entire life. Sounds, sounds kind of boring, but um, that's the life of a sea anemone or a sponge. They have no way of moving. Modal means that you do have that ability to move. Last but not least, you have to reproduce in some manner. Most animals reproduce sexually, but some can reproduce asexually. For instance, down here, we have a planaria. It's a type of worm. If you cut it in half, it grows the other half of its body back. That's asexual reproduction. Um, sexual reproduction is favored. It increases genetic diversity. I'm sorry I'm going fast. All of this should be review. It's all from biology. Up here in the right, you have a kangaroo. Down here on the bottom, you have a baby newborn panda bear. So body symmetry is how the planes of a body are aligned. So asymmetry means that it doesn't have any, um, any alignment at all. It kind of grows randomly. There's no pattern. And the two animals that exhibit that are corals and sponges. Radial symmetry means it's shaped like a wheel. So you can divide it into quadrants. Think about like if you're cutting a pie, you can divide it into even pie slices. An animal that you can divide like that is going to be said to have radial symmetry. Your examples are starfish, which is down in this right corner, hydra, which is up here in this top right corner, and a jellyfish. If you look right here, you can see where that jellyfish is cut in a circle or can be cut in a circle. Last but not least is bilateral symmetry. This is the symmetry that most animals exhibit. And this means you have a left and a right side that are even. And if I cut you down the middle, your left side is going to look like your right side, and your right side is going to look like your left side. So fish have bilateral symmetry. So we're not cutting them right here along this transverse plane. We're cutting them along this medial plane. And the left side of the fish's body would look just like the right side. <coughs> Same down here with this crawfish or even a shovel. Things that aren't animals can have bilateral symmetry. Cephalization is a term we're going to talk about, and it's where the concentration of sense organs are brought to the head, or just have a head. So a lot of animals don't have cephalization. Cephalization was an evolutionary feature. We're going to talk about it in our cladograms. But it means that they have, they might not have a brain, but they have an area of nerves concentrated towards the front of their body. Body size, these are going to be important. Um, I'm not going to use the terms anymore like towards the head. I'm going to say things like anterior. Anterior means it's towards the head. Posterior means it's towards the tail. Your dorsal side is your back side. Your ventral side is your belly side. Segmentation is when something has body segments or, big or, it has specialized tissues. So humans are considered segmented because we have specialized tissues. Um, also, you can look at a human's backbone and or our ribs, and you can see the segments, how they're divided. We've got our first rib, our second rib, our third rib. We've got those stacks of vertebra. If you look at an earthworm, you can see all of the little segments going down its body, all of those lines. So animals begin life as a zygote. That's right down here. So this is your egg. This is your sperm. The sperm fertilizes the egg, and you have a zygote. That's one cell big. That one cell divides into two cells, divides into four cells, divides into eight cells, divides into 16 cells, divides into 32 cells. When we get to this point, we call it a blastocyst. That blastocyst or blastula is a hollow ball of cells. So the cells form around, kind of like a bouncy ball or a play ball. There's nothing in the middle, and the cells make a circle on the outside. This is how all of you started life. This is how all animals start life. They all are the same in the first few days. And this one even goes through days. So day two, day three, we're day four. So it takes four days to become a blastocyst. So four days after implantation, you're already a hollow ball of cells. Then this blastula starts to pinch inward. And when it pinches inward, it forms germ layers. And we have three germ layers. The mesoderm is the middle. The ectoderm is the outside. 
like you're going to exit the building. The endoderm is the inside. And then you've got this blastopore or this hollow area in the middle. So essentially it starts out as a round body of cells and then it caves in. I guess you can't see my hands that well. There we go. It caves in and now you've got these three layers. The outside, your ectoderm, your mesoderm, your endoderm. And this area in the middle would be the blastopore. It literally looks just like a deflated ball. And then from there, we can form lots of different animals. Um, the mesoderm can split, and we can form an anus and a mouth. That's a protosome, uh, a deuterostome. We get a mouth, a coelom, and an anus. So there's lots of different things that can happen. And this is just a quick overview of all the phylums. We're going to go over all of these in detail. So this is what we're learning from now on. So you've got phylum periphera. It is the most basic phylum. It is sponges. After that, you have phylum cnidaria, which are sea anemones, hydras, and jellyfish. From there, you go to phylum platyhelminthes, which are completely flatworms. The most dominant or prominent is the planarian. It's free living. It can swim on its own. It lives in fresh water. And what makes the planarian cool is this guy can regenerate his body parts. You also have a tapeworm, which is a parasite. From there, we go to phylum nematoda, which are roundworms. Um, think pinworms. If you little kids get them a lot of times playing outside in dirt, putting their hands in dirt and then putting them in their mouths. They get the pinworm eggs and then they get pinworms. Um, past phylum nematoda, we have phylum analidia, which are segmented worms. We're going to talk about the polychaetes that live by the hydrothermal vents. Phylum mollusca, your squids, your clams, your snails, and your bivalves. Phylum arthropod, we are not going to spend a lot of time in arthropod. It is the biggest kingdom. However, the only arthropods that live beneath the sea are crustaceans. Phylum echinodermata are your starfish, your sand dollars, your sea cucumbers, your crinoids, and your sea stars. And last but not least is phylum chordata, which includes all of the vertebrates. So, now that you have taken your test and dealt with me till the end of this presentation, while I try and do two things at once, you are going to get on your Schoology account, and you are going... to pull up this Introduction to Animals worksheet. Use the information in the PowerPoint to help you answer the questions. So the questions are going to ask you about animal symmetry. So if it's bilateral, if it's radial, if it doesn't have symmetry. So this starfish, for instance, would be radial. I can divide it like pieces of a pie. It's going to ask you about using the terms superior and inferior. So superior means it's above, inferior means it's below. So the hands are what to the feet? So your hands are above your feet, so your hands are superior to your feet. So you're just going to click and drag that. It asks you to label the posterior, the anterior, the dorsal, and the ventral. You can always go back to your PowerPoint for that. And the same thing with the crab. It asks you to label the anterior, which is the front of the crab and the posterior, which is the rear of the crab. If you have trouble determining the anterior of an animal, always look for its eyeballs, its head, or its brain. And that's going to be the anterior. So for this crab, here's his eyeballs. So that's the anterior. It's just eight quick questions, and that's all I have for you today. I'll see you tomorrow.